Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Melissa Siegel. I'm a professor of migration studies and this is a channel about all things migration. So today we're going to continue with our country series where we look at a specific country and focus on the migration history, the migration policy, and the current migration situation in that country. Today we are looking at South Africa. So I'm going to continue here with looking at the migration policy and governance in South Africa today. If you're interested in the history of South Africa, please check out my other video on that. And if you're interested on the migration situation in the country today, you can also check out that video here. I'll also make sure to link it in the description below. If you're interested in any of our other videos on the channel where we look at uh, the migration situation in a number of other countries, please do check those out here also. Now, let's just jump in and get started talking about the migration policy and governance in South Africa today. So there's a very specific policy and legal framework within South Africa. You have the Aliens Control Amendment Act of 1995. This expanded the protection protections of migrants by restricting their time spent detained without trial to 30 days and the policy also promoted skilled labor migration by establishing an immigration selection board that would review the experiences and the experience and qualifications of migrants while simultaneously increasing security against irregular migrants at the time. Then we also have the Refugee Act of 1998. This was the first migration related legislation that the new democracy introduced. This act was based on the, prem on the premise uh, of the UN Convention on Refugee Protection from 1957, as well as uh, the OAU's Convention on Refugees. So in theory, this act allows asylum seekers to seek asylum and grants them freedom of movement. So then we have the Green Paper of 1997 and the White Paper of 1999 and the Immigration Act of 2002. These acts all redefined migration to promote skilled migration. This act was successful in increasing skilled migration uh, from Africa, though it also increased the number of deportations. The Immigration Amendment Act of 2004 also redefined the migration policy to prioritize skilled migration by reducing the number of permits available and to encourage applicants from certain professions, some um, categories or classes. The Immigration Amendment Act of 2007 promoted a pro-African agenda by making changes in favor of cross-border traders, and it makes it also easier to study in South Africa for other Africans. Then we have the Refugee Amendment Act of 2008, and this amendment was seen as a response to the growing number of asylum seekers that South Africa was seeing, particularly from Zimbabwe. The act enforces temporary control and deterrence at the expense of asylum seekers' rights by removing the refugees' rights to the same basic health care and primary education as, um, as South Africans and limits refugees to only those who are non-citizens, permanent residents, or recognized refugees in other countries. The 2015 Refugee Amendment Act and the 2016 Immigration Amendment Act expanded the sanctions of foreigners who overstay their welcome, and it also is meant to protect the confidentiality of asylum seekers unless it's in the public's interests. So these acts were also seen as a response to the irregular migration um, at the time. Then we have the, in, the White Paper on International Migration of 2017. This delinks residency and citizenship and implements a points-based system so that South Africa can grant citizenship strategically um, so that it can also promote skilled migration. The White Paper also implements a review system whereby refugees may be repatriated if the origin country is deemed to be safe and at the same time withdrawing the rights of asylum seekers to move freely. The Border Management Authority Act of 2020 increases the power of the DHA by proposing the borders be overseen and regulated by the Border Management Authority. Now, if we look specifically at migration governance and who are the key stakeholders from a government perspective in South Africa. So first we have the Department of Home Affairs or the DHA. This is the chief governing body in charge of um, migration and whose 
core immigration services are to administer admissions into the country, determine residency status of foreigners, and issue permits. Another important player is the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. Though the admission of migrant affairs is done by the DHA, here the DIRCO has a substantial stake in migrant governance as they determine South Africa's foreign affairs. Then we also have the Refugee Reception Office. Anyone who has fled their country for fear of persecution and has documentation needs to report to the nearest Refugee Reception Office to put in an asylum claim. We also have the South African Defense Force and their mission is to protect the national borders against irregular entry and also by means of maritime control around the borders. So then we also have the South African Human Rights Commission that may, is their job is to ensure that human rights are not abused within the country. So in 2020, South Africa also declared a state of emergency and this was due to COVID-19. It also introduced a harsh lockdown which included closing of all of the borders. Um, to date, South Africa still operates under a state of disaster, and the state of disaster appears to have little impact on the government's migration agenda and has been criticized as an excuse for the state to push through some of its policies related to securitization, but also the instrumentalization of, xenopho of xenophobia for exclusion and scapegoating, or at least these are some of the um, accusations that have been made or levied on the government during this time. Policy experts have also said that some governments are taking advantage of, of the crisis to push through legally dubious and hardline migration policies that can't be justified by public health concerns. So obviously this is a real concern in South Africa. So it does seem that South Africa is, has been putting in place more and more policies to try to reduce certain types of migration, but at the same time has still seen a growth in temporary and irregular migration. So South Africa has also signed a number of bilateral agreements with other countries, particularly with some of its neighboring countries, including Botswana, Lesotho, Mozambique, and Swaziland. These treaties created conditions and obligations rec related to recruitment, employment contracts, remittances, and deferred pay. Also with regard to taxation, documentation, and, in and insurances that are still in place today. So South Africans' mines have heavily benefited from these agreements. The mining industry makes up 9.3% of South Africa's GDP and has around a half a million workforce. Migrants who are working in this sector mostly come from Mozambique, Swaziland, and Lesotho and make up 40% of the workforce. In 2000, though, this number was as high as 57% of the workforce. So this industry is very much reliant on immigrant labor. South Africa also has a number of what are called exceptional visas that are offered to its neighboring countries um, when they are in times of crisis. There are a number of examples of these. So one is in 1996 um, when amnesty was created for nationals of the Sadek region. This brought in 124,000 migrants. Also from 1999 to 2000, there was an amnesty for people from Mozambique. And between 2009 and 2010, there was also a special dispensation for Zimbabweans um, because of the hyperinflation crisis in the country at the time. Now, South Africa is also uh, um, a signatory to a number of international conventions and UN instruments. So uh, they are um, a signatory to the UN convention relating to the status of refugees. They are a signatory to the UN protocol relating to the to the status of refugees. So basically, um, they, they are um, signatories to the 1951 convention and the 1967 protocol when it comes to uh, uh, refugees. They are also signatory to the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. There are also a number of Organization of African Unity instruments that they are also a party to. So one is the convention governing specific aspects of refugee 
um, problems in Africa. And another is the white paper on international migration that is from March of 2017. However, South Africa has not signed the International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and members of their families. So of course, there is still some work to be done. If we look at the Southern African Development Community or SADC, which South Africa is um, party to, this is of course a regional economic community that includes Angola, Botswana, Com Comoros, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Eswatini, Lesotho, Madagascar, uh, Malawi, Mauritius, Mozambique, Namibia, the Seychelles, South Africa, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. So SADC has adopted a number of instruments and commitments related to labor migration in the region. So they have the Protocol on Education and Training, the Charter of Fundamental and Social Rights, the SADC Draft Protocol on the Facilitation of Movement of Persons, and the Declaration on Tuberculosis in the Mining Sector. So these, this is a way that Southern African countries can also work together and helps to, to some way um, work on migration also. Besides these protocols that I just mentioned, there have been also several programs implemented to make the protocols a reality in the region. So here the, we saw the Regional Decent Work Program between 2013 and 2017, which developed practical labor systems in the region. Then there was also the revised regional indicative strategic development plan. This was for 2015 to 2020. And uh, this had the intention to allow for a more effective migration of students and academics in the region and to facilitate labor movement to support industrial development in the region. They also created the Labor Migration Action Plan for 2016 to 2019, which governed all labor migration pro from providing statistics and monitoring work con working conditions. We also have the Labor Migration Policy Framework from 2014 14, which seeks to promote the rights of migrant workers and facilitates bilateral and multilateral agreements in the region. And we have the Protocol on Employment and Labor, which seeks to create mechanisms that combat human trafficking and smuggling while promoting the fundamental rights of migrants and creating social security systems in the region. Of course, we have a number of regional partnerships and agreements that are important for migration and policy and governance. Another is the African Union and the new partnership partnership for Africa's development. The importance of migration in developing Africa can be seen in a number of frameworks that guide uh, labor migration in the African Union. Some of these frameworks include the African Common Position on Migration and Development from 2006, the Migration Policy Framework for Africa from 2006, and the African Union Commission Strategic Program for 2014 to 2017. This aims to promote labor migration um, with the idea to fill labor gaps in the continent. South Africa is also party to the Joint Africa-EU Strategy Action Plan Partnership on Migration Mobility and Employment, which we've seen uh, worked out over several different time periods. It's also part of the AU Declaration on Poverty Eradication, Education and Inclusive Development, and part of the Joint Labor Migration Program, which is an African Union-led initiative supported by the International Labor Organization, the International Organization for Migration, and UN ECA. Additionally, there's also the African Union Declaration on Migration from 2015. So really, a number of important um, partnerships and strategic programs within the African Union on migration. Now, there are also NGOs and civil society organizations that are quite active in South Africa on migration issues. One is the Group for Refugees Without a Voice. Um, another is the Consortium for Refugees and Migrants in South Africa. Another is Refugee Children's Project or the Wits Law Clinic. Um, particularly the Refugee Unit, the African Center for Migration and Society, and uh, Refugee Law. So of course these are not the only NGOs and civil society organizations, but these are some of the more prominent ones. There are a number of UN bodies that are also active in South Africa, just to name a few. So um, IOM is an important player in South Africa. They also have um, the Migration Dialogue for Southern Africa, and this aims to foster in 
informal regional dialogue and cooperation on migrated related issues. IOM also works in partnership with UNDP and UNHCR to implement projects. Um, and it's also party to some of their key protocols, obviously, like the 1951 and 1967 refugee conventions. So ILO is also an important player in South Africa. Um, South Africa actually rejoined the ILO in June of 1996 after a 30 year absence due to apartheid. So two ILO migrant worker specific conventions um, that are um, important here are the Migration for Employment Con Convention and the Migrant Workers Convention. So as I mentioned before, the International Organization for Migration, the UN Refugee Agency, the Office of the United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights, um, the New Partnership for Africa Development and the African Union are all important um, international organizations that South Africa is, um, is also working with. So I hope this just gave you a quick understanding of the migration policy and governance situation in South Africa today. If you're interested in the migration history, please do check out that video. If you're interested in the current situation of migration in South Africa today, definitely check out that video. And please do like, subscribe to this channel, leave us some comments and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss any of the videos I upload every week. And I do hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.